Okay, so in our video series on emergency medicine, in this video, we'll be talking about raised intracranial pressure. We'll discuss that what is the presentation and what are the causes of raised intracranial pressure. We'll discuss that how do you treat raised intracranial pressure step by step. First of all, intracranial pressure is defined as pressure exerted on the brain tissue by external forces. This is the brain tissue and the pressure exerted by external forces. What are the external forces that exert pressure on the brain? There are two external forces. One is CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, and the second one is blood. Cerebrospinal fluid is present and produced in the ventricles that are present deep in the brain. Lateral ventricles, third ventricle, fourth ventricle, they contain and they produce cerebrospinal fluid. Now, whenever there is excessive production of the cerebrospinal fluid or decreased drainage of the cerebrospinal fluid, it results in accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid within the ventricles and ventricles are dilated. These dilated ventricles exert pressure on the brain resulting in raised intracranial pressure and its manifestation. Other than that, whenever there is trauma to the brain, that trauma results in bleed around the brain. The bleed around the brain also exerts pressure on the brain or any intracerebral hemorrhage or rupture of the artery can also cause accumulation of blood or hematoma resulting in increased intracranial pressure. So pressure is exerted by CSF fluid or blood. Normal intracranial pressure in adults is less than 15 millimeter of mercury. Now, what are the causes of raised intracranial pressure? Raised intracranial pressure can occur due to any tumor in the brain or any head injury resulting in hematoma formation or depression of the bone into the brain, hemorrhage, infection, meningitis, encephalitis, hydrocephalus, cerebral edema, status epilepticus. These are all the condition that can result in raised intracranial pressure. What are the symptoms with which a patient presents to you in raised intracranial pressure? If the patient has raised intracranial pressure, patient will present to you with headache, holocranial headache, which is worse on coughing and leaning forward. Because coughing increases the intracranial pressure normally, and in these patients, they already have increased intracranial pressure and coughing further exacerbates, is resulting in exacerbation of headache. Vomiting, increased intracranial pressure causes stimulation of the chemotrigger zone resulting in vomiting in these patients. Altered status of mind, the patient are drowsy, listless and irritable. An interesting thing that occurs in raised intracranial pressure is Cushing's response, also called as Cushing's reflex. What is Cushing reflex? Basically, in the raised intracranial pressure, the pressure inside the brain is increased. Pressure inside the brain is high. That pressure causes compression of the arterioles and arteries supplying the brain. So there is ischemia to the brain occur, lack of blood flow to the brain occur. What brain does is that there is lack of blood supply coming to it. So it orders the body to increase the blood pressure. The blood pressure increases, patient develops hypertension so that the pressure is high and blood can flow through those compressed arteries and arterioles. Then when the blood pressure is going up, a reflex takes place. A reflex around the carotid baroreceptors. The carotid baroreceptors present in the aorta detect a very high blood pressure and they just reflexively cause wiggle stimulation and slow down the heart. What the brain is trying to do is that brain is trying to raise the blood pressure. When the brain is trying to raise the blood pressure so that more blood can flow to the brain, that high blood pressure will cause stimulation of carotid baroreceptors and carotid baroreceptors would think that the blood pressure is so high, blood pressure is going up that carotid baroreceptors will stimulate the vagal nerve. It will stimulate the parasympathetic supply to slow the things down, to slow the heart down. So that vagal stimulation by carotid stimulation, carotid baroreceptor stimulation causes vagal stimulation and that vagal stimulation causes bradycardia. It slows down the heart. So what you will see will be that there will be hypertension in the presence of bradycardia. That is called as Cushing's reflex. Another interesting thing seen in raised intracranial pressure is chain stokes breathing. What is chain stokes breathing? In chain stokes breathing, hyperventilation takes place followed by apnea. Person is breathing very fast and after some time, 
person is not breathing at all. That is called as chain stokes breathing. Hyperventilation followed by no breathing. That is called as chain stokes breathing. Now, why does it happen? Whenever there is raised intracranial pressure, what body does that body tries to wash out carbon dioxide because washing out carbon dioxide would cause vasoconstriction in the vessels of the brain resulting in lowering of the cerebral pressures. Now, when the body hyperventilates, hyperventilation would lead to washing out of carbon dioxide from the body. Whenever hyperventilation takes place, carbon dioxide is washed out from the body. When carbon dioxide is washed out from the body, and as we said in COPD video, that carbon dioxide stimulates the brain center. Carbon dioxide stimulates the respiratory drive. Whenever there is carbon dioxide, it stimulates the respiratory drive. And when the patient is hyperventilating, there is no carbon dioxide. Stimulation of the respiratory center would be stopped and respiratory system would shut down and patient would go into apnea. So hyperventilation to wash out carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is washed out, respiratory stimulation is gone, patient goes into apnea. And whenever the patient goes into apnea, carbon dioxide starts to build up in his blood. And when carbon dioxide builds up in the blood, that carbon dioxide will stimulate the brain center, respiratory center to, to ventilate, to hyperventilate. So hyperventilation takes place. And then that person hyperventilates and carbon dioxide is washed out. The respiratory drive is gone. Patient goes into apnea. Then carbon dioxide builds up that stimulates the brain and hyperventilation takes place. So that is a vicious cycle that goes on called as chain stokes breathing. Pupil changes. Initially, there is constriction of the pupil and later on, due to raised intracranial pressure, there's compression of the third intracranial nerve. Third cranial nerve uh, compression results in blown out dilated pupil. Decreased visual equity due to compression of the optic disc. If you do fundoscopy in these patients, you would see papilledema. What is papilledema? If you see, this is a picture of a normal fundus and see the round circular optic disc, the beautiful optic disc at the back. And if you see in this picture, this picture is showing papilledema. The round circular optic disc margins are blurred. They are totally distorted. This is papilledema seen in raised intracranial pressure. But papilledema is an unreliable sign. What you can rely upon is the venous pulsation. Now, if you see in this picture, in this video, if you see, you can see, appreciate something in the optic disc that is pulsating. A vessel is pulsating at the optic disc that is called as venous pulsation. And if the venous pulsation is absent, this shows papilledema and it is a more reliable sign. Investigations that you need to do in raised intracranial pressure, full blood count, LFTs, glucose, clotting profile, serum electrolytes, toxicology screen, chest x-ray and CT of the head. After you have done CT of the head and you have ruled out a space occupying lesion, a mass in the brain, then you can go for LP. If you don't do CT and if the raised intracranial pressure is caused by a tumor, a space occupying lesion and you directly do LP without going for CT, without doing CT. If you do uh, LP in the presence of a tumor in the brain, there is a risk that you would cause brain herniation and death of the patient. So if the patient is having tumor or mass in the brain, you should not go for LP. And you must do CT scan of the head to rule out space occupying lesion. Coming to the treatment of raised intracranial pressure. Treatment of raised intracranial pressure begins with ABC approach airway, breathing, circulation, correct hypotension. If the patient is having hypotension, you should maintain the mean arterial pressure above 90 mm of Hg and treat seizures if the patient is seizing at that point. Take brief history and examination that whether that patient is having any uh, chronic illness, any history of tumor, mass, any history of infection, look for any meningococcal rash. If the patient is having Neisseria meningitis, as you said, meningitis is a cause of raised intracranial pressure, look for meningococcal rash, look for previous carcinoma that might have spread to the brain, metastasized to the brain and caused raised intracranial pressure. And then a very important step is to elevate the head of the patient. Elevating the head of the patient can reduce cerebral blood flow due to the gravity effect and can reduce lower down uh, intracranial pressure and is a very effective step. If the patient is intubated, what you can do is that you can slightly hyperventilate the patient. You can reduce PaCO2. 
normal ph co2 in the blood is from 35 to 45 what you should do is that you should set the ventilator setting on 26 to 30 mm of hg a slightly lower margin of carbon dioxide partial pressure now why are we trying to hyperventilate or why are we trying to reduce carbon dioxide in the blood because lowering carbon dioxide would cause cerebral vasoconstriction vasoconstriction of the vessels in the brain and vasoconstriction of the vessels in the brain would reduce intracranial pressure immediately so hyperventilation is a very important step in reducing intracranial pressure so you should keep the ventilator setting on pocu2 from 26 to 30 mm of hg so till now, what we did was that we raised the patient's head and we hyperventilated the patient. After that, we can give an osmotic agent, Minitol, that drains out the water. Minitol is a diuretic. It drains out the water and reduces intracranial pressure. Minitol can be useful, but Minitol has one problem, that it can lead to rebound raised intracranial pressure if you use it for a very long time. What you can do is that you can give 20% Manitol solution 0.25 to 0.5 gram per kg IV over 10 to 15 minutes. And you would see the effects within 20 minutes of administration and the effects would last 2 to 6 hours. While you are draining out water from the body, because Manitol drains out water from the body, try to keep serum osmolality around 300. Do not exceed about 310. Coming to corticosteroids, steroids are not effective in reducing intracranial pressure. They are just effective in reducing the edema surrounding the tumors. If the patient is having a tumor and that tumor is causing edema of the brain and raised intracranial pressure, in that case, you can use steroids. What you can do is that you can give dexamethasone 10 mg IV and follow with 4 mg 6 hourly IV or per oral. Consider other measures. Consider measures like sedation of the patient using anti-epileptics and therapeutic hypothermia. Therapeutic hypothermia is very effective. How can hypothermia reduce intracranial pressure? What hypothermia does is that hypothermia causes vasoconstriction of the vessels and that vasoconstriction of the vessels reduces the intracranial pressure because when the vessels are vasodilated, there is increased blood flow and it will increase the pressure. When you vasoconstrict the vessel, there is decreased blood flow, decreased retention of fluid and decreased intracranial pressure. Restrict fluid intake to less than 1.5 liter per day. Aim to make a diagnosis. Try to find out the cause and try to treat that cause. And if there is any exacerbating factor, exacerbating factor like hyperglycemia, hyponatremia, hyperglycemia, hyponatremia cause cerebral edema. They contribute to cerebral edema. So try to treat these exacerbating factors, especially in diabetics. If there is any definitive treatment, if the, if the cause is such that there is a definitive treatment, like if there is a hematoma and you can drain out that hematoma by bar hole craniotomy, try to treat the cause. In summary, we talked about what is raised intracranial pressure, the causes of raised intracranial pressure, symptoms of raised intracranial pressure, Cushing's response, chain stocks breathing, investigations, ABC approach, brief history, elevate the head, hyperventilate the patient, give osmotic agents, manitol, give corticosteroids only in patient having tumors resulting in raised intracranial pressure, try using therapeutic hypothermia, restrict fluid, try to find out the cause and treat the cause. So this was all about raised intracranial pressure. If you liked my video, please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on emergency medicine. The link of those videos is given in the description below. Thank you very much.